So yeah, I want to go, I'm going to give you what I'm calling two versions here. It, I don't know, Lisa, if you've already primed the crowd, but the first version is the more intuitive, common one. We're going to put dollar values on things. The, the first version I want to talk through is these um, stopping short of putting dollar values. We can quantify um, and choose indicators that allow us to think about these outcomes in an economic context. It's giving us more economic content about how important these things are to, to different beneficiaries. Um, the virtue there is, again, I'm going to try to give you the sense that this actually helps teach people about these ecosystems. And it's cheap and it's, again, it's quantitative in a way that you can't really argue with. You can always argue with what an economist does to get a dollar value. So there's going to be trade-offs here. The key thing is I'm not violating the principles of economics when I talk about these indicators. They're completely consistent. They both require the kind of ecology we've already been talking about. So this is a tactical question of which, what kind of audiences you're trying to reach, how much money you have, um, that kind of thing. So these non-monetary benefit measures, again, what we're trying to do is quantify things that we know from basic economic principles are going to affect the value of these ecosystem services. Lisa and I will refer to these and others in the field as benefit relevant indicators. Um, and let's talk about what those are. They're measuring things like what can we, how many people are actually going to benefit from this? Um, how scarce is what we're talking about at different scales, whether we're talking about a county or the whole Bay watershed or the nation. Um, obviously, the more people who benefit, the better. The more scarce this service is, the more valuable it is, as opposed to if it's completely abundant. Another thing that we can quantify often is, are there substitutes? Should we, you know, we could talk about a forest, depending on the benefit in play, Maybe grasslands are a substitute for that forest. It really depends on what specifically we're talking about. Um, and then are there complementary features uh, present? So an example of this would be if you're talking about, well, we've got the trout, the recreationally valuable trout. Are they in a place that anyone has access to? Can we actually talk about access, quantify it, and things like that? And you'll note that what this is all about is basically about where you are in the landscape. And so this is, and the reason Lisa and I have been married for 20 years is we kind of connected, again, 20 years ago, she was a leader on GIS analysis and I wasn't. And, uh, but anyway, we started doing this kind of spatial counting of this stuff. Um, and of course the capability there, not only the software, but the data has gotten much, much better. And so you can do a lot of things pretty easily now. Just some more examples of what we mean here. Let's say we're, we're constructing wetlands or, or restoring them. You know, how many farmers in a local um, area would actually benefit from a positive increase in, let's say, groundwater recharge? Um, can we count the number of structures and infrastructure and housing that would be protected from flooding by these? How many recreators will benefit from their contributions to increase species abundance? Um, this is just common sense. That's all it is. But the point is you can quantify some of this common sense and present it in an economic framework. These are old slides. I apologize. Lisa made these probably 15 years ago, but I still love them. And this, I'm just going to give you one simple example of how you quantify one of these kinds of things. So we've I'm doing this in the context of we're comparing these two sites. So Rich, maybe, I don't know if this is starting to get at what you're talking about, but. Um, and let's think about the aesthetic benefits we're gonna get from those two sites. So one thing you can do with GIS, of course, is actually ask the question, where can you see that site from? It's literally a topological, topographic issue. Um, so you could start quantifying the size of the view sheds. That would be a very crude measure. You can then intersect the view shed with different kinds of land uses. This would tell you something about where people are, how many of them are there, whether maybe even whether they're kids or whether they're poor. 
Um, and then you can kind of, again, just with basic spatial data, and these are made up numbers, you can start delivering a message like this. Well, when we're talking about project A versus project B, um, we're delivering this outcome that is intuitive to people, and here's the quantitative answer that is one piece of what you might want to think about. It's got economic content, but it is not a dollar value. So just to add some other examples of what you could do, you could be counting the number of wells that are being protected from saltwater intrusion by these sites. Again, you're, you're using aquifer mapping, for example, to do that, and well data, which is available from the census. You can similarly, if these wetlands are protecting against storm surge, you can actually just be counting structures and even adding up the value of those structures that you're um, protecting. So now the question is, if you go to your decision maker or your, whoever your audience is, is this working for you? And, or would you really rather just have someone come in and take all of that and give you, well, here's what that, you know, site A is worth versus site B. And that's, we can disagree on that. But now let's talk about where those numbers would actually come from and why it's not as simple as, oh, someone's just going to tell us the answer. Okay. So just a word here, this is not a seminar about these economic methods. We could do that some other time, but one slide on it. There's a suite of methods we use. Um, they rely on different data. They can get at different kinds of ecological benefit. You know, sometimes we look at, well, if the wetlands are protecting flooding, we don't need to build a levee. So the benefit of the wetlands are part of the benefit of the wetlands. We could use the cost of building the levees as one measure. We can look at people's behavior, where they recreate, how much they spend when they recreate, and kind of try to estimate a value of a site, a beach, for example, based on that kind of behavior. We can measure how much homes right on the water cost versus the same kind of home that's a mile away from the water, and that tells us something about the value of the water to the homeowner. Um, and then there's stated preference methods. This is glorified opinion polling, in effect. It's glorified and that it's rigorous, and there are all these kind of rules that we as a discipline apply, but you're, you're basically simulating choices that people make in order to back out a value. So that's enough on that. A key thing, and now this is kind of your consumer guide to, if you start seeing valuation studies, um, the key thing is that most of the studies you'll see are only capturing a very a sliver of the value of a wetland, let's say, or a green space. Um, and that's because these resources tend to be either bundles of things that are providing a variety of benefits or because they're kind of inputs to the system and affect, again, this kind of cascade of ecological effects. So this picture, um, you know, if you, if you wanted to come up with the total value of a nearby park um, or yeah, state park, let's say, it's providing a lot of things. It's providing, again, habitat for species. We may value the existence of those species. It's providing visual amenities. It's providing recreational opportunities. It may be avoiding flooding. It may be contributing to commercial harvests. And the point here is that if you want to capture that whole schmear of benefits, you kind of need to hire five different economists. We don't all do all of these. And a lot of times what you'll see is a study that just is taking like one piece of that benefit. And what you see in the published literature is usually this kind of thing. So just be aware of that. Um, okay, we've already talked about how the value of these things really depends on where in the landscape it is, um, both for biophysical reasons and social reasons. We've talked about how valuations are incomplete a lot of the time. And again, we know that, but we don't always do a good job of putting that right up front. And now I want to just kind of conclude with 
kind of a word of buyer beware that some valuations you'll see are primarily for promotional purposes and are less kind of what I call scientific or relevant to management, certainly. And just a couple slides on this. Um, ecosystems are incredibly important. Uh, they're incredibly valuable in one sense of the word value. But something that's really important to understand is that economics doesn't measure importance. It seems like it kind of should, but it really doesn't. All it really does is it measures the benefit of one of these incremental changes. And one way to convey this is to talk about diamonds and water. So which is more important, water or diamonds? Audience? Water, thank you. Um, but if you look at the price of water and diamonds, you know, diamonds are incredibly, incredibly expensive, and water is not. And why is that? Well, because what the price of something is, it's just measuring that incremental, that next one. And diamonds are scarce, whereas water usually isn't. And so all the value is capturing is the importance of things under a specific supply and demand condition. That's all that economics can tell you about. So, key theme, don't, don't ask economics to tell you the value of the bay. It cannot ever do that. Um, because removing the bay as an, as an entire bay is not something we have any information on or it's not realistic and so it, Again, economics can't tell you that. What we can tell you about is the value of having a little bit more of something about the bay or a little bit less of it. Coincidentally, that's what decisions are about too, so that's okay. Um, but just to reiterate, this is not about the value of nature, the value of the Chesapeake Bay. And if someone tells you they can tell you the value of the bay, they're selling you snake oil. Which brings me to this famous paper that I have a love-hate relationship. This is the Costanza paper. And I'll make the point, this is the final way I'll make it. This has been an incredibly influential paper. It's been good for me. Um, but I would call this a promotional result rather than an actual result. And they would too, I think, to a certain extent, the authors. Um, and, you know, one critique of this is, you know, when you say the value of the world, in effect, is $33 trillion, no, it's not. It's a lot bigger than that. And so, you know, what would you actually pay to preserve the world? You'd pay everything you could, and which is a lot more than 33 trillion. So that gives you a sense of why the number is kind of bogus. The technical reason is that, again, it's, it's not based on any kind of realistic choice or supply and demand conditions in my terminology. So again, I don't know if you'll see that kind of study, but it is just something to be aware of. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to you all. And okay.